Stress is the inflammation that robs us of life, energy, and happiness. Our typical solutions for gut health and hormone balance have let a lot of us down. We're over-medicated and underserved. At The Less Stressed Life, we're a community of health-savvy women exploring solutions outside of our traditional Western medicine toolbox and training to raise the bar and change our stories. Each week, our hope is that you leave our sessions inspired to learn, grow, and share these stories to raise the bar in your life and home. Today on The Less Stressed Life, I have Michael Rubino, who is championing the new frontier of holistic health. He is really, truly doing the stuff that I need for my clients that I cannot do. So that's why we're talking to Michael today. He's an air quality expert and wellness advocate who's bridging the gap between our homes and the direct impact on health. He's the founder of Home Cleanse, a company dedicated to addressing the worldwide health epidemic caused by poor indoor air quality. He works closely with the company's advisory team, which includes global wellness, well-being trailblazers like Deepak Chopra's The Chopra Foundation and Gwen Paltrow to achieve the company's mission to improve the quality of life for 100 million people each year by 2030. He's also the founder of Change the Air Foundation, a nonprofit committed to empowering the world to achieve better health by establishing safer and healthier indoor environments. And largely, he and I will probably talk about mold today, which is too darn common. And I mentioned off air that it often blows a hole in my sails. And he said, well, let's put the wind back in. So thank you for that beautiful imagery. Welcome to the show, Michael. Hey, thanks so much for having me here today. Yeah. All right. So let's just get into it. Maybe we'll start with dust. One of the things that mold loves to just eat. Actually, let's start with your story because of course that's always the most interesting. Tell me why in the world you've got all this going on. Why did it change your life into this guy? No, I, like as soon as I was born, I knew that <laughs> mold was my enemy. And, and it just, no, my dad's been a contractor my entire life. So I've been around construction since I'm, I'm literally five years old. I can vividly remember going to sites and taking a broom and messing around on these brand new constructed homes. And I learned a lot through that experience, just being around it my entire life. But actually it was Hurricane Sandy that hit the Northeast where After that, I'm working for my dad and I'm in my mid-20s. Hurricane Sandy happens and I start seeing this pattern of people getting sick. I mean, every time I ring the doorbell coming in, what are we here to take a look at, create a scope of work for? And it's, I don't feel well ever since the flood and -and so-and-so company came in and fixed it, but it's still something isn't right. And I started really diving into the science behind what happens in our homes versus the scope of work that insurance companies typically put together to fix things. I realized that there's a big difference between something looks like it's fixed, but actually scientifically is fixed. And that led to this whole journey of helping thousands of people, wrote a book, and the rest is really history at this point. I've been doing this for 11 years, and it's something that I really am passionate about and enjoy. It's every I look at every single person as a puzzle. And my job is to try to understand the relationship between the air they're breathing and whatever mysterious health symptoms they might be having. And I'm looking for correlations between tests in their home and tests in their body. And I'm trying to make all of it improve. And it's really nice because it always does. With mold, I always say it's hard for me to have an amazing symptom questionnaire. I have some, but They're just not quite good enough, in my opinion. I feel like I look at it and you just see it coming forward because fungal patterns look a certain way, but sometimes it's a little more hidden. Or if people had an earlier exposure earlier in life, they can still have some of that kind of wreaking havoc today because once mold is inside, it can create this colony over and over. But the point of me saying all of this is that it really doesn't know any boundary. And so if your adrenals are not looking like good shape, which could just look like fatigue or just poor resilience to things in life, that can be mold. If you're reacting to a jillion foods or you have adult onset allergies out of nowhere, that could be mold, right? If you got itchy ears, that could be mold if you've got rashes. So all day, every day, like you, I am looking for patterns and puzzles to put together. Because if you don't address mold and you're exposed to it, which is kind of, in my opinion, the worst case scenario in trying to heal, 
then it just kind of just comes back, right? So that's really what happens is they get better or they don't get better at a certain level and they maybe backslide. And that could maybe relate to a lot of indoor air quality. So I am kind of going down this mold rabbit hole in our conversation, but let me back up for a little bit. Maybe let's talk about big picture indoor air quality because you grew up around new construction. There's all this crap given off. So thoughts about other indoor air quality issues besides mold and dust, and then we can kind of get into some mold stuff maybe. Yeah, I mean, radon, VOCs, formaldehyde, those are some of the big ones. If you have mold, you typically also have bacteria. They're pretty much one and the same. They'll grow in the same locations, both like water. HVAC issues are probably some of the biggest problems that I see with mold, bacteria, et cetera, that we pretty much have issues with. Then you have like pet dander, allergens, and just other toxins that naturally occur in our environment. Mm -hmm. Just because we're human beings, we're going to leave our house. We're going to track stuff in with us. We're going to want to open doors and windows occasionally. Stuff's going to come inside. It's all part of the package here. Mm -hmm. The issue is that really since the 1970s, when we had this massive energy crisis and Richard Nixon's president, we start going into this direction of energy efficiency, which we have not got off of, even though we're no longer in an energy crisis. And I think one of the issues with this, not that energy efficiency and trying to figure out how to make the climate better is not important. We also have to figure out how to do it in a way where we're not dying in the process, right? And I'll give you an example of this. Almost every house today is built with spray foam and it is built to specific standards to basically make sure that there is no air exchange between outside and inside because air exchange is what actually transfers that heat or heat loss or energy loss, right? As a matter of fact, you can go to Long Island right now and build a home and they will actually do like a smoke test to make sure that nothing escapes, which is horrible because human beings can release millions and and billions of bacteria particles every time they exhale a breath. So that stuff accumulates in the environment. We have mold because we have water and water creates mold. And it's going to happen in our environment. Every time we have a leak, now this thing becomes more of a problem. We have modern HVAC systems that condensate all the time, provide a great environment for mold. And so we start chemicals, pet dander, proteins, toxins, allergens, all these things accumulate in our environment and become a part of our dust and we have no air exchange to dilute it, right? So this is becoming a bigger problem than it's ever been before, which is why we're getting sicker and sicker as a global population because we're going in the wrong direction air quality wise. We're not thinking about it. So we make advancements in medicine and technology all the time, but those things aren't helping because we're still getting sicker. 74% of the U.S. adult population is on at least one prescription drug. 60% of the global population deals with at least one chronic condition. 40% deals with multiple chronic conditions, two or more. And these numbers have all increased over the years. Everybody has Google these days and can look these things up. So we have never been sicker than we are today. And this is why I believe that this is the case. Mm -hmm. All right. You started this conversation. And it's tricky because I think there's two sides to it. Like, When you're talking about spray foam, I was like, I love my spray foam because it keeps my house nice and warm when I live in the upper Midwest and it's negative 30 degree windshield outside. (laughs) But it's a tricky situation when we're in these enclosed buildings and it's imperfect. And there's a lot of flipping of things, like you said, right? Like trying to rehab houses where we're not really dealing with stuff. So one of my clients brought up a question a while back and she said, why do you think mold is more prevalent now? Do you think we just, like, doesn't it seem like mold is a bigger issue now than it ever was before? And so what do you want to say about that? Yeah, I mean, I really think it is. I think our building styles have changed drastically. So for example, back in the day, our homes were balloon framed, which means they had gaps in between the walls where pipes and electrical all used to run up and down our house. We don't have those anymore. We have more of a closed system. So we have less air ventilation from floor to floor. The problem with that is, is that when moisture used to intrude into our homes, there was no insulation. It was basically wood frame, plaster with an air gap in between. So things dried out pretty well. So we didn't really have these types of issues. Our homes were leaky. They would breathe more, but they didn't really have these massive problems because of the way they were built. Well, then we started building with insulation and drywall, 
right? Plaster is gone, drywall's in. Well, plaster is cementuous, drywall is literally paper and chalk. Okay. So True. these things absorb moisture really well and they start creating problems. Coupled with, depending on the decade, some of the building styles that we've done, a lot of them have gotten better, a lot of them have gotten worse, right? And so there's always a trade off between what we're changing and what we're doing, how we're doing it, and what we're using to do it, right? And so these things create an opportunity for mold to grow. Modern HVAC systems, again, you still go to some older homes, they don't even have HVAC systems, right? Every home now has an HVAC system. And HVAC systems wreak havoc on our health because they have the greatest opportunity for mold and bacteria to start to grow and thrive in there. And almost nobody is educated on that aspect or what filters they might need to install to kind of slow down that process or prevent it. Or that they can clean these systems and they should clean them regularly, right? If you go on the street and ask people, hey, when's the last time you had your ducts cleaned or your HVAC cleaned? They'd be like, well, I'm supposed to do that? I had no idea, right? So we start looking at this from an educational standpoint. You know, because we don't know about it, because it's we've just been led to believe it's not this prevalent issue that it's more rare, it's not on our radar. And if it's not on our radar, we're not taking proactive measures. And then we don't find out until we get really sick, which is almost every story that I come, in, come exactly. across and into contact with, right? It's like, help me, I'm deathly ill or my kids are deathly ill, I need help, and I just discovered mold after going down this rabbit hole for five years. So it's really like this, as much as we say it's, it's more prevalent, I think people are becoming more aware and being more vocal about it, which is good because it used to have more of a negative stigma or connotation on yeah. it. So yeah, there's some stuff happening, but Hopefully, a lot of the commentary I just provided answers the question in a roundabout way. Yeah, no, it does. And I think I'm going to add to it a little bit, some perspectives. Really, the last like 10, 20 years, there was a lot of chitter chatter about candida as the fungus of type. But what if it was like mold anyway, right? Because mold is just a more, in my opinion, more aggressive fungus that just burdens systems further. I think I was always dealing with it. I was just oh, if I wasn't successful initially by my timelines that I prescribed for myself that were pretty normal for people, right, pattern recognition, then I must just need to keep going and be a little more intense. That could have been mold earlier. For me, there was a turning point on how much I was seeing mold. I feel like I like to catch mild to moderate mold. When something is severe, there are people who are special as a mold. Your experience is people are deathly ill. I'd like to get way before that when it's more of a chronic annoyance, like I cannot get rid of this rash type thing. Because once you get deathly ill, it's like there's this, some instability that happens medically. And so it's just kind of nicer if they're working with a specialist. So I'm kind of hanging over out over here of like, I hate to tell you this, but it looks a little moldy, these symptoms, right? There's all these patterns that present. And so the only thing that kind of sort of takes the wind from my sails is if it's in the home at that time, and so it's kind of like swimming upstream, right? Like you are trying to empty the bathtub, but there's a hole in the bathtub, right? Like you're not going to get that person better when they're exposed. So the problem is, I do want to go back and talk about HVAC because really good comments about that. But big picture, mold stuff, the thing that comes up the most for people, and this is kind of loaded, in my approach to this is, let me test your body. Because if I can test your body and we can see it in your body, then we can kind of see where it's at. I actually didn't finish the story I was trying to tell you, sorry. My turning point was when I had this woman with narcolepsy and all of her other symptoms got better except for this weird presentation of narcolepsy. Her mold test showed that her mold results were just moderate. I was like, well, nothing to lose here. Let's proceed. She had a massive, very characteristic die-off style reaction from changing up her glutathione and her mold supplements. Worst case scenario for me, like die-off reaction would be like the hot sweat. It's kind of like you feel like you're sick, like you got a fever or something. And then she had the best sleep of her life and best. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is the turning point. Like you cannot discard stuff that does not look life-threatening. <laughs> the rest right. of it is very important too. I love the mild to moderate because we can do something. The only thing that sucks is when you live in it and you cannot tell that you live in it. But clearly you do because all the stuff is like, I just had someone who just moved out of a one house to another and now she's better. Fantastic, right? But this happens a lot and there's a lot of emotions wrapped up in this. So I want to talk to you about the thing that I run into the most, which sucks, which is people want to have someone come inspect and fix the problem, but the inspectors do not find anything. 
what are we going to do with this, Michael? (laughs) What is the answer to that? Maybe there's a lot of answers because I know we can talk about things you can do on your own, et cetera, but help me out. We need to fire all the inspectors and start over. Um, Yeah. So here's the flawed logic here. We have 50,000 companies in this space of, let's call it remediation, because that's Mm -hmm. typically what the industry people call it. I call it something different. I'm trying to create healthy environments. Let's just throw away remediation for a minute, because honestly, it just brings you back to this industry that was created by insurance companies so that they can make it look like it's better, right? Mm. The issue with these inspectors and why they don't find anything typically is because all of them have a pump and a little aerosol disc, and they essentially just want to collect an air sample in the center of each room charge you a couple thousand dollars, send it to the lab, get the report from the lab and forward it over to you and tell you everything looks normal. I mean, I I kid you not. This is what most people want to do. Why? Because it's easy. Doesn't require much work. And what they think that they're doing is they think they're providing people with peace of mind. But we can't have peace of mind until we have truthful information. And if you're calling an inspector, yeah, peace of mind is good, but you're typically trying to understand if there's something going on in the home that could answer the question of why you're feeling the way you're feeling. And so when you go in and give people this false sense of security, by not answering that question properly, you're not actually doing anybody a service. You're doing them a disservice. You're making everything worse. It sucks. Because now now you're going to extend the amount of time it's going to take for them to circle back to that problem all over again, and then finally find the answer. And so I actually created an answer for this. I created a product Thank called God. the dust test. Uh, yes, the dust I've seen test, this test. Okay, so with the dust test, people can test their dust in their house themselves. It is the better screening tool as opposed to an air test. And then they can take that information and call these inspectors and say, here's what I had found that's abnormal can you help me figure out where the sources of this are coming from? And if they start telling you, no, I don't like that technology, then just delete them. They're gone. Mm. Go to the next person until you find somebody who actually wants to utilize science to help you figure out solutions to problems because that's what we need. And I think that's the best answer I can come up with, guys, other than shutting things down, opening a school, retraining inspectors, creating a new certification. And to be honest, I don't have time for that right, right this moment. Right. So I want to yeah. empower people to, to take their own decisions into their hands. Yeah, that was super helpful because the only thing that really sucks about mold, everything is fixable, Michael. It's just that the thing that sucks about mold is there's no end to this money meter that can happen when you start to get into the quote unquote remediation game. And that just induces a lot of stress, which is essentially going to be a giant root cause of all health stuff anyway. So it's like, Kind of been a bit of a, a sore spot for me, <laughs> to well, be perfectly you know, honest. Yeah, I totally understand Pete, and agree with you. It's because a lot of people, especially people that we rely on as professionals to guide us through this, they don't understand the science themselves. So it's like we have science teachers that don't understand science that are teaching us science. Like that's what's happening. And the worst part about it is the classroom is our home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And the home is making us sick and we're trying to get answers. So it's almost the most ridiculous thing on the planet. Mm -hmm. And you have these mold remediation guys who then are supposed to follow a plan by the inspector. Here's where it all gets screwed up. The inspector doesn't get us the data we need. Then the mold remediation guy is working off a work plan based upon the lack of data that he has. And now we just get into this vicious cycle of, okay, my house was remediated, but I still have express the same symptoms. Why is that? Exactly. Because they didn't actually do the right what they were supposed to do. Now, the right way to do this is get the data, look at all the sources, because I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care how nice of a home you have, Gwyneth Paltrow's home had multiple sources. It's not just one little thing. You're going to find problems all over the house. And so when we get down to that, then we're looking at data and saying, well, how much is each source actually impacting the air that we're breathing? And it's not an easy question to answer, but you have to look at data and you have to interpret, okay, well, this spot, which is in the HVAC, which is the lungs of the home, is clearly creating more contamination that's spreading across the home, that's impacting each of the 20,000 breaths that I'm taking, 
by allowing these particles and toxins to come in contact. And what's crazy about all this stuff too, because a lot of people say like mold's not that big of a deal. It can't harm you. Go on the American Lung Association website right now. And what you will learn on the American Lung Association website is that any particle smaller than 10 microns poses the greatest human health risk because it is too small for our body's self-defense mechanisms. And so it immediately bypasses our mucous membranes, our lungs, and it enters our bloodstream where it can just wreck our gut, which obviously we understand the gut-brain connection is going to cause issues with the brain, which is why brain fog is probably one of the largest symptoms, right? It just ruins everything. It ruins everything. Hormones, I mean, you name it, right? I mean, I could tell you stories of almost any diagnosis you could think of and seeing some correlation to how their environment's creating an impact on them, right? But going back to this, okay, so what do we do about this? Well, we need to hire people that understand science and understand data that can help us build a plan. Now, I will tell you, this is why I want to put wind back in your sales here, because the whole money aspect of this, I will tell you that you can do something about your place. I don't care who you are, how much money you have, you can make a difference in your place right now with the resources that you have. Now, if you have a bigger home, you have more resources because you were able to buy that bigger home, right? So if you have more issues and it's going to cost a little more than the average person, you should be able to do that or maybe downsize. I don't know. I'm not a financial advisor. But what I'm telling you is no matter what situation you are in, you have to make that decision of how you're going to handle this. And I've worked with people with $10,000 budgets. I've worked with renters that don't have any budget. I've worked with people that have million dollar budgets, right? The bottom line is every single one of those people, I was able to advise how to take the proper next steps to get themselves into a healthier environment. And there is no reason we cannot do that. Yes. Okay. We're going to go there. Before we start talking about simple things, I think there's a list of things that everyone can do in their home. They can feel inspired to do today, but you have this dust test. If the dust test comes back with positive results, it's like, let's go remediate. For me, my test is like, let me look at the body because that's all I can control. Can I control your home inspection? So now I'm happy that you filled a gap here. Thank you so much. So if you have that being positive, one of the questions, or maybe negative, maybe some inspectors come. This is actually a client question that submitted this for you today. She said, what are some of these aha hidden sources of mold or places when you feel like you've already looked everywhere and you've changed your floors, et cetera? Number one, HVAC. Number one, hands down. It's the number one problem I see. As a matter of fact, I think the HVAC system has more of a capability of causing us harm than anything else in our home. And I would put a close second would be crawl spaces, basements, because they're both subgrade spaces. And then the spaces that our HVAC systems are located in as well, right? Because the HVAC is really going to be the bigger piece here. You got to think about it's a pathway across your house with all this duct work and stuff like that. It has an evaporator coil, which condensates all the time, which is why we have drip pans and drain lines that drain the water away. So it's a wet environment where mold and bacteria can literally thrive. You probably don't have a good enough filter that would protect you from a small enough particle, Mm -hmm. which is a, a big part of the issue. Indoor air quality. When you think of indoor air quality, you typically think of HVAC and heating and cooling and having a comfortable temperature. It's actually not what it means. Indoor air quality really is talking about, is it ventilated? What sort of filtration do we have? What sort of moisture controls do we have in place, right? So a lot of HVAC professionals have absolutely no clue about mold or bacteria, and their systems are vulnerable to mold and bacteria. Blows my mind every single day. But you know, we have a whole industry that tests people's houses that don't know how to do that either. So I digress. Yes. Yeah, we'll go to answers because everyone wants some answers here today. We're going to kind of make a roundabout list of like things we can do. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about I tagged you in social media this week because I had a leak this week and I'm going to tell you what I did and you can tell me if I did things wrong and it'll be fun. <laughs> okay, first up, cleaning the HVAC system is not an expensive thing, in my opinion, from what I have experienced. 
It also took me almost a decade to realize I need to clean the HVAC system in my house, sadly. And the guy's like, wow, that was really dusty. <laughs> oh, thank hey, listen, you. I, I was 25 years old before I ever realized it, so no, no harm, yeah, no foul. It happens. So clean HVAC, but is there also like some lights, UV lights and things? Like, do you have any comments? Let's start with ducts being clean. Then let's talk about HVAC systems and filters and assessing the HVAC system. Yeah, what so think I think clean? ducts being clean is very vital. because And it don't How just often? clean once a year. And actually, once a year, if you have a good filter, if you don't have a good filter, probably twice a year, spring and okay. fall. Better If you invest in a better filter, you can go longer without cleanings because you're going to be stopping these particles from getting into the unit, right? Cleaning the not just the ducts, but the system, the cabinet, the coil, the blower unit, like the the HVAC unit that we typically see in some closet or attic space or our basements, right? Mm. That thing needs to be cleaned too because that is the mothership where all this stuff will actually grow, okay? So cleaning that is top of the list, okay? Second part of the list is investing in a filtration system that can stop these particles from continuing to get in there. That's huge, right? And economically, that'll help lessen the amount of cleanings we'll need to do. So. Mm -hmm. There's that double whammy there. I would say third most important thing, and now I'm just riffing at this point, so please stop yep. me. Fantastic. Is Love it. the buildup of our dust, right? Our dust is going to have microbial pathogens, toxins, you name it. Everything accumulates there. Heck, you could test formaldehyde in the dust, right? When they test for lead, what do they do? They test the dust. Everything we don't want to be breathing in is in our dust. And guess what? Our dust is everywhere. If I were to turn off my lights right now and put a flashlight on, I'd be able to show you how much dust is in this environment. And that's with air purification systems out the wazoo, all the things, right? It's because our dust, it just, it's just how it works, right? Our dead skin cells, our hair follicles, all of this stuff accumulates in our environment. I have two kids. These guys generate a lot of dust. You wouldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. And it's part of our ecosystem. Well, I Right. And so we have to try to be diligent about removing it because every time we remove it, we're not just removing those skin cells or hair cells. We're also removing contaminants we don't want to be breathing in. Right. Yeah. So I would say those three things, if you did nothing else but those three things, I promise you, you'll notice a major difference. I'm off making a note on figuring out how to open my HVAC system to clean the cabinet and the coil and the blower unit. I would say it's probably better off hiring like a NADCA certified professional because I'll tell you, the coil has got two sides to it. Both sides are like two inches thick. There's a million pieces of metal in there. And when you look at it, you will probably go, how the heck do I clean this thing? All right. I'll see what I can find. I live in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> but, you know, meanwhile. Okay, let's talk about filters. So I'm going to get to my story later. But when I had this water intrusion, third water intrusion of the year, but the first one that I actually allowed to sit because I was gone out of the country. And then I came home and I was like, oh, awesome. Mold. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so anyway, the next day I was like, okay, I am going to call. We can talk about air filters here too. I have three brands of air filters. Clearly this experience, I was like, oh, clearly these Intellipure filters work better than the other two. Fantastic. You agree with me. We can talk more about that. I Let's do. talk about furnace filters. So I was like, okay, husband, I'm actually just going to call and tell beer today, get one for the HVAC system. He's like, well, that's fine. But he made a, a comment that I was like, oh, interesting. But I feel like you're going to have a different feel. He said, oh, that's fine. But it's really only going to run a couple hours a day because my house is spray foamed. So my temperature is really regulated. So my HVAC system isn't running much in the day. I was like, oh, it's interesting. Maybe I should just put a filter in every room that runs actually all day instead of putting on the filter. So then I stopped and I didn't buy the thing, right? Which that is a little bit of a fancy purification thing on the filter. I think we're going to talk about something cheaper for filters. So let's just unpack filters on the HVAC system and better filters. Okay. So I think you're talking about the Super V, which yes, is like their whole home mm -hmm. air purification like system. Bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is also a filter. Mm -hmm. So I just want to explain what an air purifier is. Yeah. It is a vacuum and a filter. That's no joke. That's what air purifiers are. And a lot of them have bells and whistles and all these crazy things. But essentially, the most important part of any of this is the filter itself. How small of a particle can it remove? So your Super V, if you were to invest in that, it would actually 
negate your need for filters elsewhere, like at the unit, or sometimes people have filters in their grills, right? Where they like open up their ceiling and change the filters. This would replace the need for all of that because it would essentially stop everything right at that point from getting to the system. So you wouldn't need filters everywhere else, nor would you want because it's such a robust MERV 16 filter that too much filters can actually cause a too much air restriction, which would mess up the unit too, right? So that's step one. Now, let's say 2,500 bucks, you're falling off your chair way too much. I would argue that when you do the math, it's going to work out in your benefit because that filter lasts like can last up to three years. And the filter replacements, you start doing the math, it's actually pretty much right around the same price point as some of the Bex filter sets you would get at big box stores. Mm -hmm. But anyways, let's just say you can't get over that hump and you want to just get top of the line filters at like discountfilters.com or something. Mm -hmm. Get the highest rating, Merv rating that you can, but you also need to understand and you'll need to talk to an HVAC person and understand based upon the size duct that you have, based upon the size unit that you have, what is the highest rating you can get? Because these are just going to be one inch pleated filters or two inch pleated filters, right? And so if they restrict too much airflow, you're going to have an issue. So now you start getting into calculations and things that mechanical people can do to kind of help understand yeah, you're that so problem. so over my head right now. I was like, oh, dang, what does MERV mean? Yeah, it's an efficiency rating for a filter. Higher the rating, the smaller the particle removes. That's the key, right? So you want higher, better than lower. But like, let's talk about going to Home Depot, Lowe's, big box stores, right? The Probably the highest you will find is MERV 13, mm. which 13, it basically won't do a thing for mold. It'll probably say mold on the package. It's wildly misleading because mold can be, be between two and four microns and MERV 13 can get down to... 0.3 microns. So you're missing probably a half of the sizes of molds that typically you would see encounter. So I don't know if you only want to protect against half the mold, maybe that's better than no mold. But in my opinion, if you can get up to MER 14, 15, or 16, you're going to be much better protected. And we start thinking about bacteria too, which is another problem that often accompanies mold. Bacteria is much smaller than mold and MERV-16 is probably about the only thing that would protect you against bacteria. Okay, just don't mind me processing all of this filter information. So first things first, people could change the filter to a higher MERV rating. Can we say that pretty easily yep. without yep. getting too specific? Because I don't want to get lost in the specifics, even though that could be easy. Like, oh, if they're like, oh, I glazed over when I had to figure out what kind of duct I had. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to go with higher MERV rating. We're going to change the air filter on the HVAC. We're going to clean the HVAC up to twice a year or maybe twice a year unless we have a really good filter. Okay, so we're talking about cheap things anyone can do to improve their indoor air quality, which is a flipped conversation of remediation. It's like, why don't I just improve my indoor air quality? Because dust is crap. So at my goal is reducing dust, right? So mm -hmm. air filters and HVAC massively improve dust. Okay, let's keep talking about cheap things, or maybe we talk more about air filters. You know what I was thinking? You said, oh, it's a fan and a filter, which reminded me of the viral Instagram reel of someone making a filter box fan and a filter. And I was like, not sure about that. Technically an air purifier. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. If you tape a filter to a box fan, it technically would be an air purifier. The only thing that would be missing is this beautiful little case and high-end marketing price tag, right? I think at the end of the day, though, like the most important part of any air purification system is the filter itself, right? So I think I've seen that viral photo as well. That is probably not a very good filter. So a box fan with a filter, there's obviously going to be air gaps. It's not going to be hermetically sealed. So there's a lot to be said about that effectiveness of that. But at the end of the day... That's essentially what they're trying to show you. They're trying to show you if you're on a budget, really what a filter is something that's creating a vacuum, like a motor blowing air in one direction that's pulling air from another direction, right? And a filter so that these particles get trapped in the filter so that by the time the air comes out the other side of the machine, it's cleaner, less particles, better for you to breathe in. That's the whole concept of air purification. Unfortunately, 
these manufacturers of air purification systems, they just start throwing more bells and whistles that you don't need, right? Yes, I do have one of those. And that is why like, it's just a race to who has the best marketing, right? And so they just start throwing all these things in that you really don't need. And we don't even want to go down a rabbit hole naming all of them because there's just so many of them. But essentially, to make things simple, you can find good air purifiers out there, probably even on Amazon, probably for a heck of a lot cheaper than some of the big brand names. And all you need to look for is, well, what size particle can this remove? And you want to get the smallest one. And that's how you should really use to compare. Yeah. Is that truthful? Like they're well, not, no one's holding them to that, right? I mean, there's one of the most popular brands has one of the laziest studies I've ever seen where they just put their filter inside of an HVAC duct and use that information. But mm-hmm. that's not the same as how effective it would be inside their own machine, right? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, is that truthful? It's their truth. Yeah. You could always take their truth and probably find other truths with it, which is what makes this whole thing convoluted. But I think when you're looking for how do I do this on a budget, you're probably going to have to hope that what they're telling you is factual. Yeah, it's tricky. We made a document that pulled pricing, names, et cetera, and the filtration rate for multiple purifiers. And then I'm going through my stuff. A lot of stuff is experience. So then I'm only concerned if someone uses a popular air purifier, I'm thinking of a couple brands, and then they don't really see a difference in anything. Well, then I'm like very sad about this, right? I only want people to result. <laughs> they spent $1,000, right? Right, exactly. So that's kind of what sucks. I'm like, well, I tried a few brands, guys. Pretty sure Delapure worked real good. That's just where I'm going forward. But it kind of stinks in reverse if people spent a whole bunch of money on it. And it's like, well, not really working very well. I don't know if you have any feelings about that. It's just kind of a, unfortunately, I'm not sure if your air purifier is effective. Yeah, I mean... I have seen no some really yeah. bad stuff. That's about the best I can say without dragging people through the mud. I and know. Stuff. What I would say is, as like you've had good experience with IntelliPure, I've had great experience with them since 2017. I've done particle counting I was wondering. Um, in front of big name brands and IntelliPure and like bar none, it's the best results. Yeah. I haven't done every brand. But- and on the note of not dragging companies under the bus, if you go to like YouTube and you search particle meter and air purifier, you'll find someone else that will do this. I was like real close to buying an air a filter meter one day. I was like, Chris, you just don't need this right now. <laughs> this is not a necessity. Just buy an yeah. air purifier. Okay. You brought up something. You mentioned something about the grill and the filters. And I got me thinking about fil- other ventilation systems in the house that I think are probably important to discuss when we're talking about indoor air quality. So let's talk about ventilation systems in the house, the filters that go out of your microwave or stove or bathroom or all the things. What do we need to know about that, if anything? Yeah. So any mechanical ventilation system we have, like our dryer vents, our bathroom exhaust vents, our kitchen exhaust hood, all these things are drawing air out that typically either need makeup air or have makeup air already, depending on the engineer that was involved in the process when the home was being built. So if it's really long ago, they might not have done some of these modern day calculations to make sure you have enough makeup air coming in. This is going to be way over most people's heads. So I'm going to try to simplify this and say the bottom line is the amount of air exchange from indoors to outdoors is really important. You want to have enough air changes per hour or per day that make sure that you're bringing in fresh air, even if you have a spray foamed house. And you can do that with things like ERV systems or HRV systems, depending on where you are in the country, if you need that heating element or not. But the point is is that there are ways to do these types of tests, like uh, manual J load calculations for HVAC, blower door tests to make sure we have enough makeup air coming into our environment. Because if we don't, we're going to be breathing in a lot more particles than maybe our neighbors, friends, or family will be because there's just no air exchange from indoors to outdoors. So if I'm just thinking about how people figure this out, you said there are some ways to measure this stuff, but then I got to find someone who knows what the hell I'm talking about. So my question actually is, if we go back to this dust test... Does that help determine if we have good, in theory, right? Like a very 
down the line way of kind of trying to decide, is this helping with me understand if I have good indoor or outdoor? Where does someone start trying to understand if they have good indoor outdoor exchange? Who's the you, person to call? Mechanical ventilation expert, mechanical engineer. Yeah. Eric Schofield, Air Care Technologies comes to mind. Guy's super sharp, very intelligent, super nice guy. Hit him up on Instagram, ask him some questions. He can do calculations for you. Have him on the show. It's a very okay. important endeavor. I had a client recently where I went and addressed mold. But as I'm there, I'm like, man, this house is just sticky. Like it's, I just feel sticky in this house. And I'm going up and down. And I'm noticing humidity is higher upstairs and downstairs, like mm -hmm. not like 60%. In some cases, the temperature upstairs is not good. I was like, listen, this is above my head. I'm not a mechanical engineer, but I'm going to bring in somebody to take a look at this system. Well, I got like a 15 page report about how there's all these things wrong with the house. Mm -hmm. And I told the client, I'm like, look, looking through all this report, seeing all these things wrong with the house, like the way your air is exchanging is not done properly. Your ducts are leaking like crazy. You're adding all this moisture into your living space that you just doesn't need to be there. And it's going to cost, there's so many little things that need to be fixed, right? It's going to cost a pretty penny. But at the end of the day, there was all these other complaints that they had all along, like, hey, it never gets cold in this room, or hey, it never gets hot in this room, that is going to be fixed in the process. So he's not going to have, not only going to have cleaner air, but more comfortable air because there's all these things wrong with the system. So it's, Definitely something worth exploring. Mm -hmm. It's um, definitely a problem in this office building where I rent a building, where I rent an office as you're talking like, oh, they have these problems here. Call Eric. He's your guy. <laughs> yeah, call Eric. But we were actually able to figure out that this house had a problem, starting with testing the dust and then mm -hmm. going next with source testing, figuring out where some of these problems are. We found like stucco issues. The great grating is bringing water towards the house and mm -hmm. soaking it in pass the stucco into the structure. So we're able to find a bunch of things and we're still in the process correcting them because it's going to take some time to address some of these HVAC things because there's so many little things. But probably within the next two weeks, this thing's done, resolved, and he's got a healthier place. Not only feels better, but scientifically is improved. And we're excited to see the lab's from the bodies of the family later as they start to progress into that healing phase. I think the because this is very technical and scientific, right? What I do and where I bring experts in to cover some of the gaps of my knowledge. I think what people have to understand is creating a healthy home is important. I understand that it is technical and a lot of us have not been educated on this, but it doesn't mean that we can't put a team of people around us to help us solve problems. Just like if we were building a house from scratch, we would put a team of people like an architect, like an engineer, right? Like a designer that would help us build us our perfect dream home, right? This is something that we can do. And as I said, I've helped people with virtually no budget to people with unlimited budgets and everybody in between. How do we do that? Well, we do it by data. We address the worst problem areas to give them the relief that they need. And sometimes... We're even advising them, listen, this place that you're renting, the landlord is not willing to make this a safe place for you. Here's an attorney. You need to get out of this lease. Mm. And sometimes that advice, as much as it sucks to hear or to have to even give that to somebody, sometimes it's exactly what they need. Yeah. Well, a lot of times people are looking for permission to do things. I mean, just mentally, I think there's a big piece of that. What about insurance covering some of these things? What do you want to say about that? I want to bang my head against the wall. No, I know. Can I, can I have that. permission to do that? <laughs> it's just so crazy. And insurance. home insurance sucks as bad as health insurance. I think if they're the same people, we <laughs> have to be. I think what happens is the way policies are written, it has to be a sudden and accidental occurrence. Imagine if it was written in the health, like you had a sudden and accidental occurrence that you got sick. <laughs> It has to be a sudden and accidental occurrence. Like I went away from on vacation and I came back and my house flooded because the pipe burst in my basement. That would be yeah. a sudden and accidental occurrence. Mm. Okay. But I'm going to give you an example that happens all the time that no one ever is covered for. My basement has water accumulation over time that allowed mold to grow and I now need to gut my basement and fix it and rebuild it. 
not covered. Why? Because it's water seepage. Water seepage is not considered a sudden accidental occurrence. Because uh, apparently, we were all supposed to know that every so often, we have to dig a trench around the outside of our house and <laughs> waterproof it, okay? And then put all this dirt back to prevent water from coming in. Because apparently, that's not an accident, okay? Yeah. So that's one issue. Windows could be leaking, right? You would think that's a sudden and accident occurrence. Nope. Because apparently you are supposed to be a door and window expert your entire life and know and inspect your doors and windows and make sure that they're properly maintained and not leaking. Your roof has to leak at a named storm. The storm has to have a name. If it doesn't have a name, not a storm. I mean, like they make it so hard to get coverage. It's good to know. Good to know. So hard. I'm actually going through the catalog of everything that's happened in my house. I'm like, oh, that was a named storm when I had that hill. I didn't. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, sir, you need to file a claim. Good. Were you hopping up and down on your left foot while you dialed this phone number? <laughs> nope. Mm, sorry. Read oh, yeah. section 13, clause F. You're just like, what? <laughs> like, people need help. People need help. All right. I mean, Good. these renovations are not the cheapest thing in the world. Mm-hmm. If ever, anyone's ever been through a renovation, exactly Amen. what I'm talking about, right? Yes. It will cost you three times as much and cost. And it was. <laughs> sucks right yeah. when we don't have proper coverage and many of us don't the other kicker to this is even if the stars align the gods have given you goodwill you have a cap on how much coverage they're going to give you and it's typically on average 10 grand so unless you knew when you bought the insurance policy 17 years ago when you bought the house unless you knew at that moment to ask for the highest mold coverage you can get, which could be 50,000, could be 100,000. Sometimes they'll cover up the policy limit. But if you didn't know to ask, they give you the minimum of 10 grand. Mm. And so now you have a flood, you have a leak, you have a problem. And they're like, well, here's 10 grand. You're like, but it's going to cost me like 40,000 to fix this. And they're like, cool. Well, you have a $10,000 cap. So we're sending you a check for 10 grand. You have to cover the rest. Thank you. Have a good day. So anyone who's listening to this right now, call your insurance company, boost your mold numbers up to the highest you can get it. And like right now, and it'll cost you like an extra $10 a month, but it is freaking worth it because yes. you'd rather need it, you have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Right. Yeah. So please you do that. You probably need it, to be honest. I mean, I built my house and this year, I thought I had three water intrusions this year. I actually had four because we had the outside. It's such a big hill storm last summer that it like broke so much. That was actually the cause. That was the impotence for three of them actually where the outside pane of the window broke which allowed for a ton of moisture to build up on the window and then whatever so i'm going to tell you a story about what happened to me a couple weeks ago when i got back from europe which by the way in europe they don't believe in air conditioning or hvac systems at all they're like we get sick here so we just like turn them off otherwise people get nose problems (laughs) Uh, i guess that's why they're healthier i guess i'm actually i contemplated that the whole time i was there because they're didn't sleep. They drank all the time and did a lot of smoking. I was like, I think it's just because they're so happy. And they, and they don't and they gain eat, any weight. like ever. And they, and they eat ever. dinner for like two hours at a time. And then they have free shots afterwards. Seven alarm. course meals. It's the craziest yeah, thing. At 10 p.m. It was very funny. I was thinking about that whole thing the whole time. I'm like, what is the answer here? I feel like they're just having fun in life. That might be it. Okay. So uh, rate my job. This is what I did. So in the basement, I have my HVAC room, right? My utility room. And next to the utility room is the basement bathroom. It has, I'm actually pretty much concrete only down there. I don't really have any permanent flooring except in bedrooms on the other end, not close to this at all. So it's concrete in there. There was linoleum in the basement or in the bathroom floor. So what happened was the air fil- or the water filtration system that was supposed to be protecting me from my hard water, I was like, oh, I get one choice to be healthy, leaked into over the two weeks seepage, the water seepage, <laughs> it leaked slowly into the bathroom next to it. And I had MDF trim, which is basically like mold food in that bathroom. And so I got home. My daughter's like, this trim is moldy in my bathroom. I am going to move things like what is going on? And I was like, oh my gosh, we have water. Anyway, so what I did was I ran an ozone generator to attempt to, again, you can rate me at any time, to attempt to kill some active mold spores so I could get in there, pull the stuff out, get it in the dumpster. Then I sprayed some botanical mold spray on it and then ran the ozone generator again. And then I tried to dry everything. 
so I could just see where I was, right? So I've got trim I've taken off that's moldy. It's disgusting. And then I've got drywall. I've got the antimicrobial drywall in this bathroom. So I scrape off the outside of the drywall that is now dry because I have now let it dry, right? And that's the important part, I think. I scrape it off after dry and then I put kills on it. <laughs> and now I'm just at a standstill. I'm like, I don't know if I need to do more because it did not, like underneath it was not moldy from what I scraped off. So I don't know because I'm like, well, I'm not sure if I did a very good job here. This is what I started with because I live in the middle of nowhere and I must do something. That There's is what a I saying did. like A for effort, right? So you get an A irregardless. A Couple things. Effort. Mold has roots called hyphae. Yes. So we cannot scrape it off drywall. All right. Because at that point, the roots have already started growing and it may look like it's gone, but it's not gone. And as a matter of fact, by the time you put the baseboard back, it'll just start growing again. And right, then the so baseboard will cover it and you'll never know. So you have yeah. to cut off the bottom. Okay. And it can grow a couple feet, right? So okay. you typically want to go like a good two feet beyond where, wherever that spot was. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and that could be a square. You can go two feet in all directions, cut out a nice square. It's pretty inexpensive to put the drywall back, right? So mm -hmm. not the end of the world. Right. But I'd rather be safe than sorry. Is there any insulation sure. behind there? Actually, no. Let me think. There is no insulation. So that's the it's utility room, bathroom. There's nothing in between that. It was just the okay, drywall. And then there's then an exterior basement wall. And that is made out of a foam block with concrete inside. Okay, cool. So I would bet, like if I was going to Vegas or something and was betting, I would bet there's mold on the beams behind the drywall as well okay. that you'll see. And you'll need to clean that off as well. Well, let's talk about the linoleum. Is it a glue down? It was glued down. I pulled it up. I pulled it okay. up as far as I could. The only thing I didn't do, though, was I had a pretty heavy vanity and over the top of it. And I was like, oh, I can move this by myself. I'm just going to get this far. And it's been real exciting because it's just been sitting there now. So <laughs> I'm like, I wonder what I'm going to do with this. So anyway, carry on. Yeah, you should kind of disconnect it, pull it out, check behind it. So depending on how much the moisture wicked up, you might actually see mold growing on the backside of the vanity or on the drywall behind the vanity. And then did you see anything under linoleum when you pulled it up? Did you see like black stuff growing in the glue underneath it? Well, what's interesting is what was leaking was a, like a, per I think there was some peroxide in whatever the crap is for the water filter thing. I'm not, don't quote me on all of this. So the water just looks darker in general. And I thought it was because it was affecting the concrete when I wiped it up. And then after it was fully dry, it was like good. So now you got me wondering, can mold grow on the concrete like that? I did not think concrete was a mold growth medium so much. Well, concrete is semi-porous and it semi can grow in anything semi-porous like wood or concrete. Okay. Most people think it can't grow because yeah. for 20 years... All of our builders and contractors have been telling us mold doesn't grow on cement. Mm -hmm. Right. They were oh, wrong. Was... They were wrong. Okay. Yeah. So I need to extract all of the linoleum. And then do I need to seal the concrete? Well, you could, because if you seal it, then you don't really have to worry about this type of stuff later. You can just yeah. wipe the floor down and you're good to go. Not that we want to wish more leaks on you, but they do happen. And yeah. It's nice I to mean, it can happen. It, that's the thing. It happens to anybody at any time. Yeah. You could do like an epoxy based sealer, put new linoleum down, and you're good to go there. But for right now, because cement is porous or semi porous, you're really going to want to like get the rest of the linoleum out from underneath the vanity and then like scrub it down really good. The botanical antimicrobial is perfect. Mm -hmm. So get that, put the it on concrete. some microfiber towels. And I would probably do a combination of microfiber towels because if it's raw concrete, it, it's kind of you'll get snagged a lot with the microfiber. And like those like deck brushes to clean like tile and bathrooms yep. and stuff. I would get one of those. And the goal is to kind of loosen anything that's in the pores of the concrete with this deck brush and then wipe it clean with the microfiber after. Okay. And if you do it while it's wet, you're suppressing the aerosolization of these particles, mm -hmm. right? So I would still probably wear a mask and gloves and, and stuff like that, but I would... Right. It's in theory dry now, but I guess I don't know underneath the vanity, right? Well, that's a big misnomer between dry and not dry and mold and no mold. Like, if there is mold, it doesn't matter dry or not. The mold doesn't just 
die off and disappear, right? right? So if it was wet for 24 to 48 hours or more, and that can happen if two surfaces are touching and water gets in between them, right? Then you probably have mold there. Mm-hmm. And it could be very misleading. I can't tell you enough how many times I've seen like the tiniest water stain of mm-hmm. like a vanity or on a wall where you'd think like, ah, it's just an old water stain, probably not a big deal. And there's like millions of spores there when they Mm -hmm. test it. And you're like, huh, that's interesting. But yeah, like they'll swab it or tape lift it, right? Mm -hmm. To test it and see what it is. And it'll be like, yeah, that was uh, a million spores per cubic centimeter of aspergillus. And you're like, Mm -hmm. interesting. Would have never thought that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because aspergillus can be white, Mm -hmm. which when you look at a water stain, it's very light in color typically as Mm -hmm. compared to like toxic black mold. Oh, there was um, white mold and black there like that had grown exciting stuff like a whole petri dish full of stuff yeah exactly i was like oh that was fun we took binders after like cleaning it up initially and then more immunoglobulin binders the next day and that was good but you know post mold like usually just feel sick so what was interesting and what like threw me really off for a moment was i had to work from home in an office on the other side of the house the next day because i locked the keys in my office in town And anyway, so I was in my office and I left my office and I was like, these rooms with Intellipure air purifiers smell excellent. And this office actually smells not good because already the HVAC had spread this around in my house. And then I became a psycho for a minute and I was like, I must have more air purifiers. And this is where I was like, do I want an air filter on my HVAC? Which at that point, yes, would have been really smart. Or do I want to also have them? in this bathroom that's not corrected it sounds like oh well i'm not done correcting the bathroom which is probably what i thought which is why i'm just over here waiting, yeah. waiting to be done with it so, so glad. i like want to want to just wave a magic wand and have it be done but it's like I'm it's okay so gl- it's no problem i'm so glad we can have this timely conversation yeah exactly yes so to point that out that investment for that system would have been great because mm-hmm. it would have stopped all this stuff from happening but that's okay too because when this is all said and done and you get your ducts cleaned and you clean your house and you remove all the dust, Mm -hmm. you'll be in a better spot. And the air purifiers will continuously help take these particles out of the air also. So you've got a good thing going Mm -hmm. and you still get an A for effort and that's tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. And And to be clear about ozone, it's not killing. I'm under the impression it's killing the top because it's sucking all the oxygen out of the air. And then I got to cut a little bit of time to work. But maybe I'm making this up. I love my ozone generator for like stuff, animal smells that I've walked into. Anyway, Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any opinions. Yeah, ozone is amazing at odor elimination. Really is. As far as mold goes, I'll be honest. Like I stopped using it probably about seven years ago now. I just couldn't find any reason to need it. Yeah, because guess- everything else you can do with just following the simple steps of cleaning the mold off the structure, removing the porous materials, cleaning the HVAC, upgrading the filters, cleaning the entire house, removing every speck of dust as much as humanly possible. It's not possible to remove everything. Yeah. And then like that'll give you a good jump start into a healthy environment. And then as soon as you continue to clean over time, it just gets better and better if there's no more sources creating these particles and toxins like the overflowing bathtub that you shared earlier. So I just didn't see where it needed to fit in. Like I didn't, I, I couldn't really rationalize why I would use it. The only reason I was using it earlier in my career is because I was told that's what you do. And so yeah. I did. Yeah. But there's so many negative side effects with ozone and I hear great things about it in medical cases, but for the home, it can yeah. damage like artwork and certain things. Sure. It is not really good to be breathing in. So people have to leave when you run it. And then it does eliminate odors, but it also, when it settles, it kind of has this like chlorine-like smell. It's like the best way to, to identify that. And that doesn't go away until you like clean the whole house again or air it out and, and mm-hmm. just allow it to dissipate over time. Right. So... To me, it's like it adds a lot more work, a lot more risk, and I really don't know what the benefits would be. Because here's my theory on particles. 
you cannot create nor destroy a particle. It's actually like a science law. And when we look at that aspect of things and you actually think about it, it would be like going out to your lawn and trying to kill seeds that weeds produce to stop the weeds from regrowing rather than just pulling the weed out by its root and tossing it aside. It's a vicious cycle. You never get rid of all weeds, right? And you definitely don't want to try to go out and start destroying seeds. But let's just say you did for argument's sake. If I crushed a seed, what would happen? It would break into tinier particles. That's true. So how do those tinier particles impact us? My bet would be not great. Yeah. So all these gimmicks of trying to kill, destroy, whatever, mold, or anything, I don't know how effective they actually are. Because we know so little about how mold impacts us already. Yeah. And it's really, it's really in nature on purpose, right? To like decompose crap. It's meant to decompose decaying matter. And unfortunately, since we're all born here, we start to decay, right? The bottom line is, let's like, I think it's, we're better off trying to not destroy and kill and all these things. And we just should focus on removing. Think about if you had dirt on your counter, your kitchen counter, do you spray stuff? To like kill it, destroy it, and then walk away. They don't. No, you wipe it clean, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with mold. We want to wipe it clean. We want to clean the area, get rid of it all, throw it away. Yeah. Oh well. On that note, a couple things. So botanical mold solution. I just happen to have. I think this was nice to have in the closet. By the way, everyone should get some. The internet says don't use bleach because it's got a water base and so it feeds the mold. Any comment about cleaning solutions? Well, the internet wins again, but also loses because your botanical cleaner is also water-based. Yeah. Bleach is water-based. Everything that you use is water-based, okay? Water is Earth's life source. Pretty much everything you're going to find is going to be made of water. That doesn't mean that it's not effective because of the water, but it is not effective because what it does is it bleaches things, right? And that's what it does. So it's going to bleach the mold. It's going to make it look like it's gone, but it's not actually going to be gone. And it's going to keep coming back because it's not actually gone. And it's not just bleach. Pretty much any product on its own two feet will not be effective. Mm. I can use the best antimicrobial encapsulant and paint over mold. And guess what? Mold's going to grow right through the paint. Mm. I can use the best botanical cleaner. And if I just spray it and walk away, guess what? Mold's coming back. Because at the end of the day, if we're not removing the roots, the mold organism itself entirely, it's coming right back. It'd be like going out to my yard and just cutting weeds off at the stem and allowing it to grow back and then wondering why it did grow back. Well, on that note then, if I'm going to remove, so a couple of things, anti-mildew sheetrock, is it useless? And two, if I have mold growing on the beams behind the sheetrock, which I can check for, is cleaning the porous wood enough? Yeah, like I would use wire brush, mm-hmm. epivacuum with a bristle brush attachment, and you're just getting into the pores of the wood and helping remove the roots. And then it's gone. And you know what I use to verify that it's gone? Hydrogen peroxide. You want to know how I use it? I spray it on. If it bubbles up, it's still reacting to the proteins that are there, and you got to continue to clean. If it doesn't bubble up, guess what? It's gone. You got rid of it all. Now, you might see the stain still because water will stain the wood. So you might still see like a water stain, but if it's not bubbling up, then it's stained and you still got it all. Mm. And that is definitely a neat trick that I learned. That's a really Um, cool trick. It's kind of like my version of a UV light to kind of be able to see what's there, what's not there, if it's reacting, not reacting, et cetera. But yeah, you have to just make sure you've got it all. That's the key. And well, on that note, I can't wire scrape, though, sheetrock and have the same result. That's just for wood. Because it's concrete. porous. Yeah, because it's so porous. The other stuff is semi-porous, right? The concrete, the wood. Yeah, so like when it's semi-porous, it basically means the pores themselves, they have a beginning and an end, right? And it can only go to the end, which is going to be at most a quarter of an inch And if you're using a brush, you're getting into those pores, you're going to be able to get in there and remove it. Because we're not talking about tree roots here. They're Mm -hmm. very small filamentous fragments that the second you start brushing them mechanically, 
it's coming off. When you get down to she rock is 100% porous, right? So it just can just grow with no end. It can grow in a tiny spot. If there's enough moisture or water, this thing can grow throughout your entire wall. Heck, it could turn the corner and go to the adjacent wall and start to grow on that wall too. There is no end, right? So, and then there's non-porous, which are things that don't have pores at all. And that's like glass and plastic and metal where it could grow on top of it, cannot grow into it, which is the easiest thing to clean up because you just take a rag and go like that and wipe it away and you're done. Mm -hmm. She rock. Damn. She rock. It's tricky. It's the Um, worst thing. Yeah. Anti-mildew sheet rock doesn't matter. So it's moisture resistant, Mm -hmm. meaning it has a less absorption rate. Mm -hmm. It just means that it absorbs less moisture than traditional drywall. Mm -hmm. Less doesn't mean it's mold proof. Mm -hmm. So that stuff will grow mold too. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. We learned so much today. Thank you so much for being a solution and a very much needed solution in this world. I probably could keep asking questions, but man, I think we covered a ton. And what's really cool is I like your approach, which is everyone can do something on any budget. It's possible. Yeah. Take the steps you can take. And if you're on a budget, make sure you're being conservative with how you're spending that money and what result you're going to get out of it. Right. So that's the biggest key. We have to make data driven decisions. And in order to make a data-driven decision, testing is the first investment you're going to make to improving your quality of air, quality of life, et cetera. Find out what you're breathing in, where it might be coming from. And then from there, you're looking at, okay, what are the worst areas and what are their impacts across the total volume of my house? And then you're focusing on top down. You can only address the worst area and maybe you have two others. They're not as bad. Then address the worst area. Those two other things about them, you're going to monitor them and you're going to be in control of it. And later, next year, maybe next spring, whatever it might be, you recuperate a bit about those two things, you tackle those next. Like a lot of people get stressed out over remediating their home all at once as if they're like renovating their entire house top to bottom. Not a lot of people can afford to buy a house at top dollar and then gut their entire house and start over right? That's not a norm. So what we want to do, just like we would be renovating a house, maybe this year we do the kitchen, maybe this fall we do the bathroom, right? We know those are are trouble spots. They're creating some issues. What can we do in the interim to just keep the toxic load that we're breathing in lower and lower? And we're putting some strategies in place for that. The bottom line is, It's time that we take control of our environment and stop letting our environment take control of us. And we just need to put the right pieces of the puzzle in place and we can do it. Yeah. What a great empowered statement to end with. Excellent job, Michael. Where can people find you online? Uh, You can check me out on Instagram at the Michael Rubino. The website is the same. And you can also, if you need help with your own home, go to homecleanse.com. And then if you're inspired by all the amazing work that I'm doing to try to change laws, like make it, make home insurance better, make healthcare better, I don't know, protect our people who are tenants, protect our landlords from their insurance companies that don't cover for mold. We have some big convoluted systems that need to be fixed. Check out what we're doing at changetheairfoundation.org. Thank you so much for coming on today. I hope that people send me all kinds of follow-up questions for a follow-up episode because it's very needed and I thank you for the work you're doing and the legacy that you're really creating. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Ask those questions. I'm ready for them. I'm excited. We can definitely do another episode. Perfect. Sharing and reviewing this podcast is the best way to help us succeed with our mission to help integrate the best of East and West and empower you to raise the bar on your health story. Just go to review this podcast.com forward slash less stressed life. That's review this podcast.com forward slash less stressed life. And you'll be taken directly to a page where you can insert your review and hit post.